from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding and the CPYU Podcast Network, you're listening to The Word in Youth Ministry, a podcast by youth workers for youth workers, where we give insights, strategies, and helps for effectively teaching God's Word to our students. Here we are on episode 63 of the Word and Youth Ministry. My name is Kyle. I serve as the pastor of family ministry at Old North Church in Canfield, Ohio. And we want to thank our friends at the Center for Parent Youth Understanding for hosting not only this episode of the podcast, but all the episodes of the Word and Youth Ministry podcast. I do want to invite our youth worker friends to join us on Facebook at the Word and Youth Ministry podcast Facebook forum, where we take the conversations from this podcast and we continue them in this Facebook forum where you can ask questions about things that you're teaching in your youth ministry or different things that are coming up. Uh, we would love to have you join us. That's the Word and Youth Ministry podcast Facebook forum. Well, today is episode 63, and I'm excited uh, to have our guest Tim Challies join us for this episode as we think about training and teaching teenagers uh, for times of suffering that they are going to have in their lives. Uh, we're thankful to have Tim Challies join us as uh, recently his book came out, Season of Sorrows, The Pain of Loss and the Comfort of God. We know that many of our listeners are familiar with him, but Tim, uh, before I uh, have you share a little bit, I want to read uh, on the back cover of, of your recent book that came out, I want to read the biography and then have you fill in the blank for our listeners. So uh, the back of your book says that Tim Challies is a pastor, noted speaker, and author of numerous articles. Tim Challies is a pioneer in the Christian blogosphere. Tens of thousands of people visit challies.com each day, making it one of the most widely read, recognized Christian blogs in the world. He and his family live near Toronto, Ontario. Tim, thanks for joining. Can you uh, uh, fill in the blanks here for our listeners? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. That sounds a lot like a biography that was written by a copyrightist somewhere in, uh, or <laughs> anyways, a copywriter somewhere in an office in uh, Grand Rapids, yes, but uh... Uh, it's very kind of them. Uh, yeah, that's that's the basics. I'm a writer, blogger, pastor of a church uh, near here. Uh, I do live with my family in Oakville, Ontario, which is just outside of Toronto right now. That's just my wife. My two girls are both down at Boyce College in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, Michaela is 17. She's a freshman there. Abby is 21, married to Nathan, seniors, and are about to move back to Canada as soon as well, she's moving back. He's immigrating to Canada as soon as they're done. Oh, how exciting. Uh, well, two resources on Charlie's.com that I want to recommend to our listeners. One is an article that you wrote several years ago. We could spend this whole uh, episode talking about, but I'm just going to mention it, is an article you wrote um, in, in conjunction with Rooted uh, Ministries called Discipling Teenagers in Your Church and Home. Uh, we will have a link to that in our show notes. And then some of my favorite resources that you have ever put out is the videos, the Great Sermon series. We will link to that in our show notes here. Uh, I love church history. I love learning from people in the past. And that is a great series of videos where you look at uh, some of the great sermons that have been preached in the past. Uh, but today, uh, thank you for taking time to join us as we think about your book, Season of Sorrow, and this topic of what it means for us to teach and train students to suffer as Christians. I once heard someone say, I'm sure it's been quoted many times, so I don't know who it originally started with, that for all Christians, suffering is either something we are in right now, something we will be in in the future, or something that is behind us. And so when we think about doing ministry to teenagers today, um, I was thinking about your book title here, Season of Sorrows, The Pain of Loss and the Comfort of God. And I'm just curious, as you wrote in this book about suffering that you have been through recently, what has God taught you about the connection between, like your subtitle says, the pain of loss and the comfort of God? Yeah, so I would agree with that assessment that in a world like this one, we're either currently suffering, we have been suffering, we will suffer. And there's a sense in which we're always suffering, not to be too dramatic about it, but just we never get over many of our yeah. sorrows, the loss of a parent, the loss of a child, um, loss of a dear friend, those things stay with us. And so, you know, they might get easier to carry in time, but they're always with us. They're always just part of our moment by moment reality, which is why sometimes we just find ourselves crying and we don't really know why, but we realize we've just been carrying this weight and this grief. So 
this life is full of many sorrows, many trials. And yet, as was my experience in, in writing the book and the, um, the experiences that, you know, that led to it, uh, I do find, or I have found that, uh, there is comfort to be had in our, in our pains and there's, God reveals himself in many ways in scripture. He reveals himself as a comforting God. He calls himself the God of all comfort and so on. Um, but we can really only know that about him or experience that when we do go through sorrows and losses. And so there are, I don't know, dimensions to God or something. There are aspects of God's character that we don't come to experience until we're in this context in which we so deeply need them. And that's when God does reach out to us with his comfort. And so uh, it was my experience that God is most present just when he's most needed, that when we cry out to him, when we need him in our pains and sorrows, he's He's right there, he's comforting us, he's blessing us. And Tim, as we think about that, and we think about teenagers who, uh, we know that the Bible is clear, there's nothing new under the sun. There's uh, teenagers today, there have always been teenagers uh, since Adam and Eve were in the garden and they got to be a teenager. Uh, but we know that in, in our culture today, it seems like older adults uh, seem to make fun of or joke around about younger adults being too sensitive or too overwhelmed by hardship. Do you think that's a fair critique or how would you respond to people who say that? I would imagine every generation has ever said that. We, we might look back now at the Second World War generation, you know, say this was the greatest generation. Look at them as as men, you know, going out and fighting the women, filing to the factories to care, carry the, the jobs that the men had been doing and so on. But I'm pretty sure that in 1939, when war broke out, all the old people thought, how is this generation going to possibly cope with this? So I think that's a way we who are older can look down upon the younger generations and, and often unfairly. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge that we learn how to carry heavy griefs by first carrying lighter griefs. Um, it's like a muscle. You don't carry heavy weights until you've worked out with lighter weights and you've built the muscle and I think suffering is a kind of muscle so that the pain somebody experiences when they're a teenager and maybe have a relatively light kind of sorrow or suffering, that is absolutely real to them. And it's probably just as painful to them as somebody who's older, who's suffered more, who's built their faith more, who has deeper wells of God's grace and truth to draw upon. Um, so I would not want to look at a teenager and say, they're not really suffering. They're not really in a time of sorrow. And, Obviously, there may be times when you have to say you're you're overreacting to this, and what you're going through is not um, worth the amount of emotion you're investing in it. But I do think we can look with pity toward those who are younger and and understand these things are very traumatic, very hard to carry, and we we should sympathize with them. So that imagery that you give, uh, which is helpful for me and I think for our listeners, as we are working with students, as teenagers come, and we know that usually teenagers are living with their parents, and so there is a lot of um, sorrow in families and extended families, and, and we're helping them, as you just said, kind of learn how to work out with these lighter weights so as they get older, they can carry these heavier weights. Um, I think that imagery is similar to the sports imagery that's even helpful that Paul uses in the New Testament when he's uh, uh, comparing and contrasting a little bit between the Christian life and sports and, and thinking through that. And so if we were to take that even a level deeper, and we think about this being the Word and Youth Ministry podcast, we want to uh, educate and equip youth workers to use the Bible in their youth ministries. Um, and we know that there are many youth workers uh, that have a variety of experiences in teaching students. So this is why on this on this podcast, we have a different types of episodes. But here we're talking about suffering, teaching kids how to suffer. What would you say to the youth worker who says, you know what, I want to teach on this topic. I We know that we worship a suffering Savior. Jesus died on a cross. We know that the Bible is clear that if we're going to follow Jesus, uh, we will be persecuted. You know, suffering is part of the Christian life. What would you say to a youth worker who says, you know what, I agree with that, but I'm not even sure where to start because I don't want to start sounding too depressing in my teachings that I'm giving to the teenagers? Well, uh, teenagers are going to encounter circumstances that are depressing and are distressing no matter what. And so just acknowledging life as, as what it is, this world as what it is, is the place to begin. Um, we have to raise 
kids to thrive in this world, to function in this world, not some fanciful one we may create in our minds. And their lives may not be any harder than ours, but they're not going to be any easier either. And um, every one of them will at some point deal with some kind of tragedy. They will deal with somebody's death. They will deal with the the loss of a job or the loss of wealth or something. And so um, I'm afraid that many people, as they grow up, they go into adult life ill-equipped for suffering. And because they've not been taught, A, that suffering is normal, and B, it's not a sign of God's disfavor, it's just reality in this world, um, they go in and they're blindsided by suffering. They don't know how to respond. And so some simply walk away from their faith because they were never told this is part of the deal. When you come to Christ, you come all the way. When he calls you to uh, into his kingdom, he calls you to, to suffer. And that simply will be part of your reality. And so you need to learn how to cope with suffering, how to deal with it, how to pass through it in a, a biblical way. And then also, I don't think people are challenged that when suffering comes, it's an opportunity now for you to dig even deeper into all that you've been taught. It's an opportunity for you to steward the sorrow that God has given for you. It's not something you pass through as if there's no meaning or no significance. It's a challenge to display the greatness and glories of God in your sorrow, in your sadness, in your grief, to think that there may be people around you who are convinced that you don't actually believe these things, that you'll believe it in good weather, but not in bad weather, or, you know, you'll you'll honor God in the, in the green pastures, but not in the valley of the shadow of death. And here comes grief, sorrow, suffering. Now is your opportunity to prove to yourself, to prove to God, to prove to the world, I do believe this. I believe in God, and I'm going to stay true to Him even through these sadnesses, even through these sorrows. I'll rely on Him and and praise His name through them. So, Tim, would you say that as you wrote this book um, and as people began to read it, I think it came out about a year or a year and a half ago, uh, what type of responses have you been getting in the sense of were people surprised to read this account of suffering that you had? Were people encouraged? What kind of responses have you gotten? Um, I, the response has been very good. Um, the only negative responses I've had have been from people who don't quite share my theology. Mm-hmm. And so they were uncomfortable with me speaking about God's sovereignty in our right. suffering. Um, some people took issue with that. Um, but other than that, the response has been good. I think it's been meaningful to people who have lost a child, which is the immediate context, but also people who are just either going through a time of suffering or preparing to, uh, which in a sense we all are, preparing to go yeah. through suffering. And people have found it helpful just to to deal with the rawness of suffering, but then to see keep seeing these glimmers of light through it and to keep just looking toward the Lord, looking toward the Lord, even in the, the hardest times and the worst days. Yeah, and that, that leads perfectly into one last question I have for you before we take a quick break. As we think about uh, just teaching what, what some would call a big God theology to students. You know, I, I love uh, the title of a book that was popular years ago, and it's having a resurgence uh, lately uh, about uh, when people are big and God is small. But really, we want a big view of God, uh, especially when we're suffering. And uh, a question I have for you before we take a break here is how if we fail to teach students about suffering, and in that, if we actually are teaching uh, students to have a small view of God, which I don't think any youth worker is intentionally trying to do. I think about our listeners here who are hearing this conversation. I don't think anyone uh, walks into the youth room on a Wednesday night and has, you know, a dozen students or or a hundred students in front of them. I don't think anyone goes in saying, hmm, I think I'm going to teach a small view of God tonight, right? But as that as this happens, if we don't teach students about suffering— And if we don't teach them to have a large view of God in the midst of that, uh, I'm curious how you might think this might really hinder them from truly walking with Jesus in an abiding sense. Because Jesus says, if we're going to have fruit that will last in our lives, we must abide in him. We must stay in him. So how can failing to teach about suffering and a big view of God hinder them from walking with Jesus? Well, I think it probably goes back to what I was saying before, that we've now left them ill-equipped for those inevitable times of suffering and sorrow. We've we've not said this is a normal thing, um, and you know we've made it seem like a strange thing. Uh, maybe we've left them thinking that when they suffer, it's necessarily because they have brought suffering on themselves. That's where we can teach something like the book of Job and see that Job did nothing that brought all this pain and sorrow upon him. Um, 
Job was a righteous man, and uh, yet he was called to suffer, and, and we may be as well. And so equipping them to, to understand that suffering is inevitable, and like I said, I think challenging them to pass through that time well, but in order to pass through that time well, they have to, um, they have to understand the character of this God who's called them through this time of suffering. So uh, I often go back to Psalm 23, which is uh, a psalm that rejoices in the relationship with this good, kind, loving shepherd. Um, and you see the shepherd and the sheep together in the valley of the shadow of death. This is not that disobedient, wandering sheep from Luke 15, 16, wherever it is, you know, who's wandered away and needs to be drawn back, you know, disobedient, bad sheep. Um, this is a sheep who's being led through the valley of the shadow of death by this kind and loving shepherd. So somehow God, the shepherd, has seen fit to lead his beloved sheep through this time of difficulty. And yet it's right there that the, the psalmist starts speaking to God instead of about God. It's right there that the psalmist says, your rod and they, your staff, they comfort me, and so on. So we have to understand that in God's good purposes, he himself may lead us through these difficult times. His sovereignty may decree we need to pass through great trials and difficulties. We can't act like this is unusual. We can't act like God has done something wrong or we've done something wrong. Instead, we need to rejoice in God's sovereignty or bow the knee to God's sovereignty and uh, by his grace pass through these things unspoiled, unbroken, even victorious. Well, youth workers and parents who are listening to this episode, I, I hope that you're encouraged as we think about a big topic like this, suffering. This is something that, you know, some people even listening to this right now who are currently in really difficult situations might even feel a pit in their stomach. This is something that we can all relate to. I think what Tim just said is especially helpful for youth workers just to teach a plain reading of the text to students. That so much of the Bible is confusing and so much of the Bible is difficult, but teaching a passage like Psalm 23 and a clear reading of it to our students is one way we can teach them uh, to find, uh, maybe some would say diamonds in the rough, to find uh, the truth of God's word that is not hidden, but that is is revealed through a clear reading of the text that all youth workers and all parents who are listening to this episode uh, can teach our students, can train our students to read a clear reading of the Bible. So we're going to take a quick break, uh, and then we'll be back here on episode 63 with Tim Challies as we think about suffering and we think about how to teach about suffering to our teenagers. So stick with us. We'll be back after a quick break. I often hear grandparents say how glad they are that they don't have to raise kids in today's world. While these comments might not be very encouraging to those of us who are parents or who are doing youth ministry with kids today, they do recognize the fact that there are lots of confusing and dangerous cultural realities that kids need to navigate if they are going to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. In an effort to provide parents and youth workers with an easy-to-use tool designed to help kids find their way through the choices they face in today's world, I've written a new little book that can be used individually or in small groups, A Student's Guide to Navigating Culture. It's the shortest book I've ever written, but it's the one I believe will have the greatest impact in terms of discipling the emerging generations. If you want to teach your kids how to live in today's culture while following God's will and way, check out this new little book, A Student's Guide to Navigating Culture. You can learn more and order copies at cpyu.org. And we're back here on episode 63 of The Word in Youth Ministry with guest Tim Challies, author of the book Season of Sorrows, The Pain of Loss and the Comfort of God. Uh, before I ask him a few closing questions, I do want to mention he has uh, several books that have been written. One of them is titled Visual Theology, and there is a website, visualtheology.church, that I recently rediscovered, and I know that some of our listeners have youth rooms and need to decide what to put, uh, what posters to put on the wall or, or what different visuals that can be used even in teaching. And uh, this is one website I would recommend to you. We'll have linked in our show notes, visualtheology.church, uh, where you can find, and we know that all students have different learning styles. So some students might hear you teach something and be able to see it. I know I was recently teaching on the end times, different views of the end times. And I went on the website, found a graphic, bought it, and was able to put it up on the screen and hopefully help give a well-rounded view uh, through. And so you can find that at visualtheology.church. 
Church. So, Tim, as we wrap this interview up, uh, I want to start by asking you, uh, for people who are listening, and we mentioned earlier about how to get started or even why we should teach on suffering, but if someone's listening and thinking, okay, I'm sold, I listened to the first half of this interview, the first portion before the break, and I know I need to teach on suffering, but can you just give a few biblical passages that might be a good place for them to start? Sure. I, I mean, ultimately, you're teaching the grand sweep of redemptive history, aren't you, where suffering starts in Genesis chapter 3, and it ends in Revelation 22. So uh, other than the first two chapters of Genesis, the whole Bible is a story of humanity's suffering and God's redemption. Um, but specifically, I think Psalm 23 is a great place to go. I, I wouldn't ever want that psalm to become a cliche just because we all love it and all recite it and speak of it a lot. It truly is one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture, as you understand it, uh, teach it. The book of Job is helpful. I know it's very long and a little bit confusing because about half of it is terrible theology, or more than half of it is uh, Job's friends saying things that are wrong, so it can be confusing. But even if you just help people understand the first couple of chapters, I think is very helpful, because here is Job, the righteous man, suffering um, you know, th for no wrong that he had done. And yet there was purpose behind it. And then you go to the end with God saying, yeah, I'm not going to tell you what those purposes are because your little mind isn't big enough to, to comprehend them. Instead, you're just going to have to trust me with it. If I'm, if I'm God enough to save your soul, you're, I'm going to have to be God enough to uh, rely on in your suffering. And, you know, someday it may become plain, someday in eternity. But I wouldn't want anyone to overlook the cross, because I think once we understand what happened at the cross, and, you know, in the book of Acts, the, the apostles, um, they're, they're praying to, to God, they say, whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And so we understand then the most horrific and horrible act of suffering ever, which was God himself, Son of God, being crucified, even though he had lived a completely perfect and morally unblemished life, he was put to death. If we understand that this was what God's hand and God's plan had predestined to take place, and yet still in such a way that those who committed that act were fully 100% responsible for it, that frames our suffering so well. Because then we can make these arguments from the greater to the lesser. If that was true at the cross, then that can be true in your suffering too. God could predestine this, yet great evil may have happened. And, um, you know, there could be people in that suffering who did truly horrific things. We can hold both of those things as being true. And so ultimately, we need to understand the cross. Thank you for sharing that. As we think about teaching students, and we know everyone who's listening to this episode, uh, we have different students. We need to contextualize our teaching to our students without changing what God's Word says. And the Bible is full of examples of suffering, and uh, thank you for that reminder that we can always tie it in to the cross. So one of those examples that you gave was Psalm 23, and in your book on page 159 of Season of Sorrow— you write uh, one small sentence that it's its own paragraph on this page. Uh, it says, the shepherd who leads them in will lead them through and lead them out. And I'm curious, as we think about that, and God being our shepherd, you even mentioned earlier about that, how your view as God as a father and God as a shepherd has changed as he's led you through suffering over the past few years. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, so that sentence was meant to just, again, affirm that God was present in my suffering and sorrow, not just present as somebody to help me, though certainly that, but also present as one who is involved in initiating this thing, the death of my son, unexpected, young, healthy, everything, suddenly he was gone. I can't say Satan did that, ultimately. I can't say illness or fate or anything else did that. I have to say that the God who numbers our days determined when my son would be born and when my son would die. And so in that way, God had led me into this dark valley. But then I also had confidence that God was leading me through. I had evidence of that every day. And I have firm confidence that God will lead me out in, in ways he has led me out. Um, you know, the path through through suffering takes time, but you really do learn to cope with these losses. You do learn to to press on. But ultimately, I know he'll lead me completely through, and he delivers me from this world, and all things are made new. And so um, God as shepherd, God as father, um, different metaphors or different ways of speaking of God, but both very, very true and very comforting. 
Those were so important to me. Um, seeing God, knowing my love for my son and tr understanding that that was just a glimmer of God's love for me was so helpful. Um, not to mention God's love for his own son, whom he um, allowed to be, I mean, mm. who he sent into this world to suffer and to die. And then God is the shepherd, the one who truly loves his sheep, uh, the one who willingly lays down his life for them and when he's guarding them and protecting them. These these pictures these are, are so, so precious. Maybe, you know, God created fatherhood so that we could better understand God, and maybe God created sheep and shepherds so we could just have these pictures and know what he means by them. Let me read that one more time for our listeners, a powerful sentence uh, from page 159 of your book. The shepherd who leads them in will lead them through and lead them out. Uh, well, Tim, thank you for taking time to join us today. One question I like to ask our guest as we end, we know there's a wide variety of people listening to this. Some of the people listening are parents. Some of them are youth workers who get paid to be youth workers and they're full-time vocational youth pastors. Others are volunteers who are giving of their time and working full-time jobs. And so a wide variety of people, but we know at times uh, being in the youth ministry world can be encouraging, can be fun. Other times can be difficult and hard. Uh, what's one or two pieces of advice you would give to youth workers to keep going in this important task of teaching the Bible to students? Well, I, I think first, the, the encouragement would be to press on in teaching the Bible. Don't grow weary of doing good. And um, we don't serve because we see results. We serve because God has called us to do it, and he's instructed us how to do it. And at the end of the day, all we have to give people who are needy, people who are hurting and broken, is what God has for them, uh, the truths he's given in his word. I've got no wisdom. I've often stood in front of a room and looked out at a, a an audience of people and thought, I have nothing, nothing for these people whatsoever. What could I conjure up from within that would carry them through their sorrows, that would help them with their hurts, that would guide them through their big questions? But what I do have is what God has for them, which is his word. And so just really, really trusting that God's word is, is true, that God's word is helpful, that God's word is effective, that God's word will do what God says it will do in them. And so equipping them. And then <clears throat> I think the other thing is continuing to have that sense of pity toward them. You know, we bring children into this world and then act shocked when they, they find this world difficult and when they sin and and everything else, but uh, we know what they've got ahead of them. We know how hard life is, the sorrows that will come to them, the temptations they'll struggle with. So I think our hearts should be really soft toward them and really broken toward them and uh, just so eager to, to comfort them and equip them according to the word. Hmm. Well, thank you for that encouragement and for taking time to do this episode today. Again, all of the different resources that were mentioned will be here in the show notes. And I want to remind our listeners if you want to learn more about the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, you can find more at our website, www.cpyu.org. This has been episode 63 of the Word in Youth Ministry with Tim Challies. We look forward to being with you next time. Thanks for listening to the Word in Youth Ministry. To learn more about CPYU and the resources mentioned on today's podcast, visit us online at cpyu.org.